Good evening, everyone, and welcome to NKU Six at Six lecture series brought to you virtually. Uh, I'm Mark Nykirk, and I direct the Scripps Howard Center for Civic Engagement at NKU, and we're the host of the series, which we've been holding for about the past 12 years. Uh, and uh, our normal course is to be at community venues, uh, the Mercantile Library, Barron's or Crawford Museum, Carnegie and Covington, uh, Campbell County Library, uh, the Baker Hunt, so around uh, around the community. But uh, COVID-19 has us uh, in our living rooms and kitchens, and it's good to be with you this evening. Uh, we have uh, uh, behind the scenes that you don't see Chris Strobel, who is a professor of uh, electronic media and broadcast at NKU. And uh, we one of the things we've been working on is increasing our security on uh, the uh, the Zoom broadcast, and so. Some of you may have seen our earlier Zoom link. Uh, we have switched to one that's more secure. And so I'm buying a little time while people that we communicate with people who connect it through the old one uh, get redirected to the new one. But I appreciate you being with us. We have uh, put together a series of six talks uh, between now and the end of May uh, that will be coming to you on Tuesdays um, at uh, six o'clock. Uh, We'll miss uh, one a couple of weeks, including finals week, uh, while our students take uh, those exams. Uh, but uh, we will be here next week, uh, uh, April the 28th, with John Vickers, who teaches in uh, Chase Law School. And John will be uh, talking about his research and work on the history of money, legal tender, uh, and the switch. Uh, uh, there was quite, quite the constitutional uh, crisis, if you will, in the mid-1800s uh, over whether uh, uh, we could have uh, paper money versus coins and what the Constitution permitted. So you can imagine a very different world had those decisions gone differently, and John will walk us through that. Uh, tonight's uh, uh, talk uh, also includes a film, uh, something a little bit different for us, but one of the most remarkable projects that I've seen at NKU in recent years is a project called uh, Morning the creation of racial categories, which has been led by Professor Joan Ferrante, who teaches uh, sociology. Uh, but it is really a collaboration of Joan and other members of the faculty and a whole lot of very creative students. It's uh, an interpretation of uh, uh, the development of the idea of race in America. Uh, you think about race uh, is not a biological concept, it's a legal and cultural concept and a creation uh, that we have um, made on our own uh, and developed over time and uh, codified in our laws. And so this project explores that and explores it very often in uh, performing arts and film. Uh, at the end of this presentation, we will give you a link, uh, but the first film, which is a little over an hour documentary, is available for viewing on Kentucky Educational Television and uh, is the larger uh, 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 first project. Uh, what we'll see tonight is a 35 minute film uh, that uh, was made last summer, I believe in June at the Aronoff, uh, which the NKU students who had uh, developed a dance, choreographed it, the music for it, uh, uh, telling the story of Margaret Garner, the slave that uh, uh, the uh, general public, I guess, knows best through um, the novel Beloved. Uh, Margaret Garner and the, her uh, husband and children lived in Boone County, uh, came across uh, to uh, seek freedom across a frozen Ohio River uh, where they uh, sought shelter only to be surrounded by the owner and uh, uh, the property they'd fled and, um, and uh, uh, law enforcement. And rather than return her child to slavery or children to slavery, Margaret Garner attempted to uh, uh, take their lives and succeeded in taking the life of one child. The story became very important in America. The trial uh, was covered, uh, including by Frederick Douglass's newspaper, and was part of uh, what made our nation's attention uh, the, uh, turn to the horrors of slavery. So it's an important story in, in American history. And what you will see tonight uh, is a beautiful telling of it, uh, of, on stage in contemporary dance. Um, and afterward, uh, India Hackle, who is uh, a, a senior at NKU, about to graduate uh, and go on to graduate school at Cornell, will join us. India has been uh, with this project throughout and is a creative contributor 
And so think of it as kind of the director's cut. We'll be with uh, India to talk about what we've just seen. Joan Ferrante will not be with us this evening. Uh, we expected that she would, but there's a, an intervening family matter and uh, uh, she's unable to join us. But India has been with Joan uh, throughout this project and I think you'll really enjoy being with her. So we're gonna uh, go now to the movie, which is about 30 minutes long and then we'll be back live for the Q&A. Thank you. About 10 o'clock on Sunday night, a party of eight slaves belonging to Archibald K. Gaines and John Marshall of Richwood Station at Boone County, Kentucky, about 16 miles from Covington, escaped by horse and sleigh. Three are Robert Garner, his mother Mary, and his father Simon. They are the property of Marshall. The other five, the property of Gaines, are Robert's 21-year-old pregnant wife, Margaret, and her four children, Thomas, age six, Samuel, age four, Mary, age two, and Scylla, nine months. The news accounts describe Margaret as about five feet, three inches in height, a mulatto showing from one-fourth to one-third white blood. The boys are bright-eyed and woolly-headed. The youngest boy is mulatto. Scylla, the nine-month-old, is light enough to show a red tinge in her cheeks. Mary was almost white and was a little girl of rare beauty. The eight rode in the sleigh to the riverbank where they walked over the frozen Ohio River into Cincinnati. Mr. Gaines, springing on a horse, followed in pursuit. After a few hours of diligent inquiry, Gaines learned that his slaves were in a house about a quarter of a mile below the Mill Creek Bridge on River Road. On reaching the house, officers attempted to force the door open. A window was suddenly thrown up. Robert presented a pistol and fired three times, wounding one deputy. During the affray, Margaret had struck her infant Scylla on the head with a fire shovel with the intention of taking her life. She slashed at the two boys, giving one a four-inch gash to his throat and the other a gash to his head. The two-year-old lay on the floor dead with her throat slashed. Mr. Gaines, the master, picked up the dead child and was in the act of carrying her off when objections were made to the body being removed before an inquest was held. He at length surrendered the child. The mother of the dead child acknowledges she killed it and that her determination was to have killed all the children and then destroy herself rather than return to slavery. Scene 1. Biological Ties Meet the Garner family in all its complexity. Witness how Archibald has invaded the Garner family space. With this artistic representation of the story, we're able to listen on more levels and 
absorb the whole understanding of the story. We are looking at a nuclear family that doesn't just stop there. Mm -hmm. There's this extension. Mm -hmm. There's Archibald, you know, and he's kind of around the perimeter. He's present, but not part. We can just say, family's complicated. Mm -hmm. And there are members that live with us, and there are members who don't, and there are members we want to associate with, and there are members yeah. that we don't. And there are people who bring out the good in us, and there are people who bring out the not so good in us. Mm -hmm. And so what I can appreciate about this scene is we're just setting up a family portrait, just opening the door to say, here's a family, mm -hmm. let's tell you a story.
Scene two, swaddled by category. Margaret's life is filled with trauma. Explore how Margaret's relationship with her two-year-old daughter, Mary, is infused with that trauma. look at Margaret and it is just this constant everyday worry and this hypervigilance. Because of that hypervigilance, we're interpreting everything in terms of Absolutely. fear and safety. Trauma brings with it this uncertainty. So many people who have experienced personal traumas walk around wondering, can the world see it? Can you see my wounding? Can mm -hmm. you see my brokenness? And that leads to this hyper awareness, this release of cortisol, mm -hmm. this this hyper vigilance, mm -hmm. you know, this constant living in fight or flight, yep. trying to keep yourself alive mm -hmm. and safe. Scene three, I love you with all my weight. Robert and Mary live as father and daughter. This relationship, however, is weighed down by complexion differences. Robert must find a way to embrace this child who was born as a result of his wife's rape. When I allow myself to remember that Mary was two years old and had no way of conceptualizing the world that was around her, I can understand Robert and loving her as a daughter but realizing the complexities that lie before them as a family. But I think about Mary, she's a child. Mm -hmm. And at this time from birth to 18 months, it's all about attaching to your primary caregivers. Mm -hmm. And that attachment or lack thereof really does form a huge foundation to how a person will go on and conceptualize the world and make further relationships. Mm -hmm. When there is love and there's something that's preventing the love from being fully expressed. I think that's one of the saddest things mm -hmm. in the world.
Robert's sadness and the weight of the situation that this family finds themselves in is evident within his body. Mm -hmm. And it would only be natural for Mary to pick up on that. Kids do pick up things that maybe parents don't necessarily want to teach their children. And then if they can't understand it, they have to come up with their own way of explaining it. Mm -hmm. And their way of explaining it could be not adaptive mm -hmm. um, or not helpful or it's hard to understand sometimes what our parents are telling us, although we can pick up there's something going on. Mary just wants to be loved mm -hmm. because she's a child and that's what children want. But she probably would never get a narrative to help her understand that. Right. Yeah, sure. and, and so that's the devastating part, I mm -hmm. think, when I look at mm -hmm. I love you with all my weight, that while that weight is in love, <laughs> that weight is also stifling and mm -hmm. it smothers not in the sense that he's overbearing her with love, but the weight of the situation prevents him from being able to actually connect with her. Mm -hmm. Scene four, were you there? Margaret concludes that the only way she can protect her children from the horrors of enslavement is to kill them. In the chaos, she is able to kill only one of her children, Mary. Were you there when she pierced the baby's neck? Were you there when she slashed the child's head? We were there, and we lost the child. We were there. We were there, and we crucified the child. We were there.
what kind of mother mm -hmm. could slit her daughter's throat, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. When you've lived a life and you've experienced life that was far worse than any death you could imagine, mm -hmm. death is not the ultimate bad, right. it's a freedom. Right. Yeah. And when I think about how difficult it must have been To know that the only way you could protect your child was to cause them harm. There's a quote by Rumi who says, the wound is the place where the light enters. But our, this wound has been not allowed to heal. And so it's like, like infected scar tissue. Mm -hmm. And it's the, the good skin can't heal over it until mm -hmm. we, we process that wound. And so as long as we're still perpetuating these categories, we are there. We, mm -hmm. we were there the day that it happened to Mary. We're still living this out today. Mm -hmm. We were there because we can understand it in today's context. Yeah. Scene five, walk together, children. Margaret's children must find a way to heal from their mother's trauma, which has become their trauma. Children, don't you get weary of together, children, don't When you think about Walk Together Children and just kind of this coming together, this affiliation that though it's hard and though it's traumatic and though it feels near death, we have each other. Mm -hmm. And that stood out to me in this scene. Sometimes music is a, something that unites, unites us and it helps us to maybe see a bigger picture. I don't know, sometimes music can help us remember that there is beauty in the world and there is love and there's there's something beyond mm -hmm. our daily lives mm -hmm. so and i think it's also that bypassing the part of the brain that wants to ask questions and it's not logical but just to hum mm -hmm. and hum with it's a and, way of soothing yourself yeah. and sometimes you know traumatized people mm -hmm. need to be able to soothe mm -hmm. those feelings of fight and flight and mm -hmm. um 
and music is a way of as regulating of regulating scene six epilogue the Gardner family reunites Archibald tries to find his place in the family space we see people in portraits who we don't think of as family that is because when the United States made racial categories it forced people to align with only those who looked like them. To get people into racial categories, our country broke families apart. I think the epilogue did a really good job of showing a little bit of the family together, but then all of its different pieces. And I think that's the point, mm -hmm. is that we have now these categories that leave things very confusing and disconnected. Mm -hmm. And part of the narrative and the conversation going forward is how do we view the whole picture mm -hmm. from the fragments that we have and see these lineages and generations of disconnection amongst family members. And that's usually where we get our identity, is that from our family and our culture and our community. And when that's taken away from us, mm -hmm. yeah, how do we define our identity? And how do we make meaning of, how does the world make sense?
Healing from trauma begins with the telling of repressed stories. The Ohio River. Our feet left the snow and slid onto a sheet of ice. I turned to retreat, but Mama clenched my arm. Her fingers indented my skin. She bent her womb-filled body to level with my eye. And with venom and a strand of desperation, she repeated, Walk! The babies were swaddled, their faces pressed to breast. There their tears slipped and their cries were smothered. Sam held onto my hand and pressed every time the ice veined beneath us. My hand began to throb, but I didn't dare tell him to let go. Mama's ankle disappeared from the surface, and as she fell, her shrieks only subsided into ceaseless moans. They beat at the ice until her foot resurfaced. Through shivering shudders, I pleaded, what are we walking for? And with a tone just as brittle as the ice, Father looks through me and says, for freedom, boy. Until I could feel him look away, I held my tongue in obedience and bowed my head in submission. Then I watched as those desperate bodies wearied across the ice. I pitied the color of them, the weight of them. I wondered, what were we going to do with freedom? Would freedom even look right on us? I pictured them in freedom. I pictured them on a sunny day in freedom. Youth restored. And the kids circling at their feet for sugary sweets. I saw them in freedom. And then I saw everyone watching them. Everyone else saw what I saw. I looked down at my brother's hand, wrapped so needlingly around mine. Would he be like this in freedom? Would he still need me in freedom? The kids used to joke that he wasn't really my brother, that Mary and Scylla weren't really my sisters. Would I lose them in freedom? I should have known that freedom was the ice giving out, giving us a way out. We just had to keep stomping on it is all. We should have fallen through. We should have fallen deep into freedom. The Ohio River poem was from the perspective of one of the Garner's sons. Um, and that poem was really supposed to highlight the, the perspective of a child who's not viewing freedom the way that um, society has gotten used to viewing freedom, which is something to be yearned for. And the only reason why he um, views it in such a negative way, and the line that's in the poem is, is this what freedom looks like? Is because he sees that in this yearning for um, for freedom, it literally um, it led his family to dis to disaster, and so he just thought that well maybe this wasn't worth it, and even if we had it, we still wouldn't fit in freedom because we're still separated by our racial appearances. Okay, well, thank you. And I, I think I can hear everyone applauding at the extraordinary work uh, that uh, we've just watched. Uh, we're gonna be joined now by 
India Hackle, who you uh, saw there in the end of the uh, film, India, that was India's poem, and she's been uh, part of the creative team since the beginning of this. Uh, India, as I mentioned at the beginning, is a senior at NKU, about to graduate in May, whatever graduation may look like in the virtual world. So congratulations <laughs> to India. Uh, she is a uh, majors in English and International Studies and is on her way to graduate school at Cornell to uh, study English and poetry uh, uh, next year. So, India, welcome. And I guess if perhaps you could just start on some reflections on being involved in this uh, project. There are so many aspects of it, the art, uh, artistic piece, the history piece, um, the relevance to our, uh, our lives today. So I'm going to let it go to you and remind the audience that uh, uh, use the chat function and we'll um, monitor for your questions. Okay. Well, thank you for um, having me. You can hear me okay, right? We can. Okay, great. Um, thank you for having me and to all of our participants, thank you for um, joining because we all know how hectic it is right now. So thank you for taking your time out. Um, I have been with MCRC, the MCRC project going on about four years now. Um, back in 2016, there was a call for participation that um, founder John Fronte uh, had. And it was, we were given a prompt and then we had to submit and we had to go through a lot of um, uh, like a panel of judges and things like that, just to make sure that our work was contributing to the overall narrative, which was just mourning the creation of racial categories. And I just want to note that MCRC never took on the initiative to tell every story or to tell the whole story of race, but we do fixate on lesser known stories and we do fixate on the stories that we really don't, as a nation, we do not have a narrative to tell correctly um, or at all. So um, the Gardner story is one of those stories in which the specifics of it we as a nation didn't know how to explain. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say, I think the most notable version of this, of the Gardner story would have been Beloved by Toni Morrison. And I love Toni Morrison, <laughs> with that it's a, it's, a, it's a fiction piece inevitably. So she had the right to do with the characters what she wanted to do and to make, um, uh, to tell the story how she wants to tell the story. But again, as a nation, we really didn't have, we really don't have the tools to go through the complexities of um, just Mary being near white or um, Scylla, which is, was, it was um, Margaret's youngest daughter who was younger than two being almost passing for white as well. And then where did we put Archibald and where did we put Thomas. So for all these characters, we don't have a narrative to say, where, like, how do we tell the story of this family? So that was the most important thing that we really tried to capture. Um, and we couldn't have done it without the therapist to really give the dance another element. Because as beautiful as dance is, as much as I love watching dance, it's something that we can all share if someone is, if two people, the therapist, can also guide us through it with an additional dialogue. So that was probably more than ags, Mark, I'm sorry, but <laughs> um, we can open it for questions about the MCRC project, about how we made the Garner piece um, or anything like that. Well, uh, India, one, one uh, question yeah. uh, immediately uh, is, um, uh, in scene one, Margaret is doing a solo dance, but there's another dancer mirroring who mirrors her dance. I'm wondering, uh, the question is one, if you could expound on the meaning of that portion in scene one. Yeah, um, Diamond Evans was Margaret Garner's, which is Lovett Patterson's uh, shadow in that piece. And so throughout this dance, we tried to make sure that it wasn't isolated to this one moment. Um, and so Diamond was supposed to be representing, again, like it's not just for this trauma, it wasn't just for Margaret Garner, but it was really supposed to capture just like with women or especially women of color and just all of these different dynamics that one can place themselves in 
and it's supposed to echo that. And we tried to do that again with um, a prime example of that is, uh, were you there? And really that question, of course, you weren't there physically at that time, but it's just to start the audience, to get the audience to start thinking about, this is not an event, a tragic event that took place a while ago. Like that's, that's not the story. That's not what you're supposed to walk away um, having to carry. You're, like, you're supposed to walk away from this saying, where else is this? Where is this replicated? And of course, maybe not the physical death of a two-year-old child, but there are deaths of children and of adults, whether it be our, our mentalities, whether it be our relationships, whatever it may be that are strained and stressed or cut off every single day because of these racial categories. So that scene, like many others, was supposed to represent that. It's supposed to represent this echo of you like you have to see this outside of this one event yeah there's also a question uh, uh you know, to, that maybe fits with the remarks that you just made about how this resonates across the decades into modern life and one of the things is uh it re resonates uh, as a uh, 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 so extraordinary for a mother to kill or attempt to kill her children uh, I wonder if the team has thought about uh, what would modern psychiatry make of Margaret uh, Garner? Um, uh, is there uh, something at work here in terms of her mental stability or just the uh, absolute horror of slavery? And uh, it's just, uh, I, I guess, maybe a modern mind trying to process this horrible thing. Yeah, I'm sure it's... Um, um... You know, I, I don't know the, the technical term for it. I don't know like what we would call it, rather it be um, like, I, I, rather it be crazy or if we want to pick up, um, I believe it was author Nikki Taylor's term um, when she, oh, so she also actually, I can't say that we've, no one has given the narrative to this because plenty have, including like Nikki Taylor and she had a, um, a piece called Driven to Madness and I think that we can apply um, medical terms to Margaret's condition to try to get our heads to wrap around what happened kind of thing, some kind of like break or whatever it may be. But I think the most important thing, even if you say, oh, she was mad, like she was driven to madness, what's important is what drove her. I think that's the most important thing. Like we can attach labels to it, but what matters is what drove her to that um, that moment? Um, again, like what I was mentioning earlier was, I can even example my, um, I can example my four-year-old niece and how she has an entire, her psyche right now is not doing too good because she sees things in front of her all the time, like blonde Elsa ponytails and all these kind of things. So it's just like, oh, I wanna look like that. I wanna do this. And she's only four years old and it's just like it's already scary and i can apply all these terms to it where it's i don't know disassociation or whatever it may be but what's driving her there what are all these images what are all these relationships what is all this weight of race that's caving in on this four-year-old to produce these results so i think that's the most, most important aspect um, that i focus on and again i think that mcrc focus on is um not just like, you know, the traumas, like how did we get here? That's the question. Just a, a quick note to the audience. Uh, Nikki Taylor is a historian, uh, previously here in Cincinnati, and now I believe at Howard University and has a, 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 a book on the Margaret Garner story that uh, I think we would uh, highly recommend if you want to uh, delve into this story a bit. Uh, we have a question that really is about you and your personal journey through this. You mentioned that a call uh, went out for students to participate. Uh, where were you at in your education then? How did participation in this shape uh, uh, what your what your interests are now as a writer and where you're going? Uh, just uh, uh, you know, talk to us about your involvement in the in the the morning the uh, project. Yeah, um, I remember when the call went out, and I was about sophomore junior year, and. Um, it was a professor, it was my sociology professor, um, Lindsay Hillman, who said, oh yeah, like you should apply. And I was just like, 
okay, I'll do that. And so when I was going over the material that we had to read in order to respond to, in order to be accepted into the project, um, it was a story of Archie and Thomas. And so that was, I won't give a full summary, but, in, but what grounded me was, it was this image in this story of a white slave. And before MCRC, I just didn't know that existed. I was just pretty sure I had this idea and this image in my head of what a slave is. And so when I had to review this story of Thomas and Archie, and it was this white slave, and it was this, it was this relationship with a black appearing slave and a white appearing slave, and how they had to try to find their way and then finally separate, I just beg the question of, okay, and this is about much, much more than skin color. This has to be about more than skin color because it's this powerful that outside of it, there's all these laws and there's all of these regulations to really control relationships. And so that's what um, most attracted me to the project. It was the story of a white slave, really. And as I journeyed through it, um, journey with MCRC, it was, it started to get tough because we really focus on um, the creation story of each category. So not just black and white, but Asian, but Native Hawaiian, all of the officially recognized cat racial categories of the US and the ethnicity group of Hispanic. And so having the knowledge of the creation stories, it makes it hard to not attach the actions and the dialogue of people to their category because we all really do embody it in one way or another in one way or another and we also carry our creation story in our interactions with each other so i would say being with mcrc and being under the study what we were studying it just made every every interaction a lot more different a lot more heavier but a lot more different um like i don't i would even say talking to a white classified like bank tailor it's different because i'm like i'm i have to apply the narrative of the abandoned category to the narrative of the abandoning category and so it just makes interactions a lot more um complicated but in a good way because then again i'm not um taking it at face value so that has been my journey so far but just trying to apply well recognize creation stories to um creations really um so that has been the journey there i'm missing something mark i'm sorry you asked like a part two to the question <laughs> yeah i think that you have answered it well uh let okay. me one um the uh, there's a we have a question that uh, uh uh really kind of begs an additional question but the immediate question is this a local project or a national project and it's really probably a good opportunity if you don't mind to just give the audience a context they saw this mm -hmm. film uh, which is just a capture of uh, the, the live dance. But I think uh, there are three films and the fourth one in the works uh, that are exploring uh, this uh, uh, sociology and history. Uh, and if you could just kind of take us uh, through what this project looks like uh, writ large. Yeah, so this was the Garner story really takes on the black and white category, the dynamics there. But our next films are trying to really um, focus on each category, like at a time and specific relationships and dynamics within those relationships at a time. And moving forward, there's no way for it to stay, like who we collaborate with, of course, um, our dancers, our professors, um, um, our local, but it has its international elements because there's no way to get around it because even when we start telling the creation story of other categories again like those are international parties in one way or another and we have to figure out what's the dialogue there and how that interacts and so i would say a, a primary a foundation piece of mcrc actually is joan for about 40 plus 40 years or so i want to say she gave an assignment for her students in her sociology class to interview someone of a different racial category than their own. And so we have this like hundreds of papers from these students where we're just getting this, this dialogue. And yeah, every now, well not every now and then, often actually, there are 
it's, it's an international presence. And so that's going to be seen a lot more. I think sometimes people think MCRC only focus on the black and white category, but it doesn't. Like we're moving forward and we're going to be able to um, really just have a well-rounded story for each category. The, um, there is an element in this, uh, in the film that we just watched and uh, that uh, is all about love and family love. And there's uh, in the mm -hmm. commentary, mm -hmm. At one point, uh, uh, there is the uh, comment uh, that Mary just wanted to uh, be loved, what yeah. as any child would. Uh, as uh, artist interpreting this, including in your poem, you are trying to get into the the minds of uh, children of different ages uh, and in a completely different era. Could you uh, talk a, 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 about that uh, process of the art? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just think that usually children have a lot more of a strict sense of what we're thinking and understanding of what we're thinking. And I think that for me as a writer, sometimes it's easier to get into that um, uh, frame just because, again, you kind of have this freedom um, just to speak. And it's it's not it's not weighed down by what we have with just like what people think of how we're going to how people are going to respond to us and what's politically correct and what's it's we have all of these suppressions and how we speak to one another which is only making the matter worse but i just don't think it's as common with children and so i think that that's a good place to hone in on and try to figure out okay <laughs> like just that face value oh another example i had um in high school, I had a friend who had a nephew who was about, I don't know, he was about three or four. And one day he just came up to me, he said, well, why are you brown? And it was just like, okay, let's okay, let's go through why I'm brown. <laughs> like It was just something, but it was a, a good moment. But you have the adults just trying to be like, why would you say that? You don't ask that. And it's just like, that's our problem right there is that we really don't have that child mentality in certain in a certain respect to say just to ask each other questions or just to talk to each other and so that's why usually I gravitate towards a um, a younger narrative because I just find a freedom in it. So. Sorry, I can't hear you. Right, and, and the one thing that um, mm -hmm. uh, is in our uh, comments as people watch is an appreciation for the work. So. Let me thank convey you. that. Thank you uh, uh, for this uh, important and uh, complex um, um, telling uh, and and the and uh, the uh, tremendous participation of, of uh, the students. So um, thank you for all of that. Um, and. Uh, the you can learn more about this uh, project on the uh, morning the creation of uh, racial categories uh, website uh, there are a lot of uh, um, a lot of the resources and access to the uh, film so you'll be able to see that um, and we're going to go to this, that slide in just a second we do have one more question uh, that just came in if I could ask you that uh, okay. five years after uh, trial and uh, the, the uh, since uh, the uh, civil war began, this story is repeated by the media on the day. How did it affect Union and Confederate sent pre-war sentiments? I'm trying to read the question. I'm sorry. Five years. So the, the, oh, pre-war. Uh, oh, okay. So oh, you, that day. Okay, okay. A lot of publicity and people following it, and uh -huh. uh, uh, the, uh, um, yeah, and then so so how really how to shape mm -hmm. American sensibilities? Yeah, well, the Garner case was. I think people. I mean, the death of Mary. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to downplay that at all. It was um, monumental and tragic. But what was really the the problem, I hate to say it like that, well, it's really the problem is that they didn't know how to try Margaret for her actions. That was the biggest thing in that, depending on where she was going to be tried, um, in Ohio or in Kentucky, and then what she was going to be tried for. Was she going to be tried for destroying property? Or was she going to be tried for murdering a child? Because if we say 
child, then that's a human life. And if we say a human life, then we have to really question slavery. So <laughs> then we have to question what constitutes as property versus, uh, yeah, again, a human being. So this was, um, it was just a huge story because of that as well. Like this was even our, um, at NKU, our uh, Sam and Chase at law school, like he was involved in it. Frederick Douglass gave notes on this. This was something that was really, that really shook the nation because we had this narrative out there that uh, slavery was okay, I want to say in the simplest sense. And so this was, a, again, another thing that was getting at the conditions of slavery are not okay. It is a problem. It drives someone to this point. And now we have to figure out, again, what to do with this human life if we even classify it as a human life. So yeah, it definitely um, was in the dialogue and in the media and it definitely um, contributed to like the war at that time, the cause of it at that time, so. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, th thank you. And uh, yes, indeed the legal complexities of people or property, which I, I think uh, um, uh, you see resonate as Lincoln struggled with the Emancipation Proclamation and what the, le what, what the legal grounds for that would be, so. Um, India, thanks again. And again, the audience uh, uh, is um, uh, applauding for you in the chat. So uh, thank you all. Thank you. On this. And um, I think we have a slide that will tell you the email address or the uh, uh, web address for the um, uh, project overall. Uh, and uh, the um, uh, in addition, uh, if uh, we can move to the next slide. Uh, uh, the uh, this link on uh, Kentucky Educational Television will take you to uh, a viewing of the uh, first film, which explores this concept of creation of racial categories uh, in some depth. Again, with uh, some artistic interpretation. Um, uh, to watch this uh, film, I've seen it a, a few times with live audiences, and it really uh, leaves people. Uh, almost uh, in stunned silence afterward and then uh, dialogue. So take a take some time to watch it. It's a little longer, I think, India, about an hour and a half, uh, but uh, it yeah. is now on uh, He has shown it statewide and now made it available uh, uh, by uh, clicking onto that link. So thanks everyone for being with us. We'll be back Thank again you. next week at 6 p.m. Uh, when we'll take a look at the constitutional issues surrounding uh, paper money, another a uh, 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 little bit uh, later, but another 19th century uh, uh, discussion. And we'll be with uh, John Vickers from the Chase College of Law. And uh, please spread the word uh, and we'll keep doing this uh, through May. Everybody stay safe and um, take care of each other. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all again. Oh, Mark? Yes. Actually, did they get the, uh, um, was the website on there? Yes. MCRC.org? Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you.